Welcome to Part H. One of the early Amiga titles I want to mention briefly was Buggy Boy, as this is really one of my favourite racers of all time, a stack full of neat ideas. Check out my full review of the game on a dedicated video on this channel. In 1992, Andrew Braybrook would release a series of original classics for the Amiga, such as Uridium 2 and Paradroid 90. But it was perhaps his original platformer, released by Renegade in 1992, that he's remembered by the most. Called Fire and Ice, it had you play a blue, cool coyote who must rescue some lost puppies and direct them home to safety. Back in 1992 as well, 3D was still in its infancy. So, when Robocop was released by Digital Image Design, many were simply blown away by its visuals. The walking sections were particularly good, with a great targeting system that made you feel truly like Robocop himself. The driving sections were okay as well, with you driving around a futuristic city. In 1992, Mindscape would release the fantastic isometric adventure called Degeneration. In the game, you played a delivery boy who realises that on arriving at Genoc Biolabs, that the building has been overrun by genetically mutated monsters. It was a brilliant game with a compelling story, full of thoughtful puzzles and compelling gameplay. In 1993, David Braben would return with a sequel to Elite, sadly alone after parting ways with Ian Bell. But Frontier Elite 2 would fill the new game with realistic world physics and an entire galaxy for you to explore. The game was brilliant, wowing the gaming world with its sheer scale and features added such as being able to upgrade your crafts. Also in 1993, American developer Silicon and Synapse, or today better known as Blizzard Entertainment for their World of Warcraft games, would release a puzzle platformer called Lost Vikings. This had you guide three Vikings, Eric the Swift, Balog the Fierce and Olaf the Stout, away from the alien spaceship that they've been beamed aboard. Thankfully, they each have skills to help them do this, with Eric being able to jump high and move quickly, Balog being able to take out foes with his sword, and Olaf being able to stop anything with his trusty shield. This set you up nicely for an imaginative puzzler as you guide your three chaps through the levels. But back to 1991, and I've always been a huge fan of French video games. I love their offbeat humour and general zaniness. Or in the case of the next two games, I love their art style. Eric Chachi of Delphine Software and US Gold would amaze the gaming world with the Polygon game called Another World, or Out of This World as it was known in the US. This had you guide a particle physicist who gets accidentally transported to an alien world by the particle accelerator in a lightning storm. The game frustratingly had lots of trial and error elements, with you dying lots as you progress the game, but it was the fantastic fluid animation, compelling storyline and art style that made you keep playing anyway. Another great French programmer was Paul Cousset, who had already brought the world cruise for a corpse and had worked with Eric Chachi on the adventure game Future Wars. He would release a game Flashback, which used rotoscoping technique used in Prince of Persia, but with many more moves that your hero could perform. In the game you played Agent Conrad B. Hart as he attempts to piece together his lost memory. A great game and a compelling story that would keep you playing through to the end. In 1992, Cocktail Vision would release a quite frankly batty adventure puzzle game called Goblins, which had three goblins work their way off each screen by solving the usually totally illogical puzzles to save their king. The game would be successful enough to spawn two more sequels in 1992 and 1993. Cryo and Virgin would create the brilliant adventure strategy game called 
Doom, which was based on the Frank Herbert seminal novel and film. The game was extremely immersive, and for fans of the book it was a great way to enter Frank Herbert's compelling world. But it was its sequel by Westwood Studios in 1993 that would be truly groundbreaking. The sequel was a totally different game, with this time it being a real-time strategy game. It is this game that would put all the building blocks in yep, place for Westwood's later games, which were the Command and Conquer series. In 1993, Blue Byte would take the city-building concept further with the lovely game Settlers. What was great was the detail touches to the inhabitants, from the little piggies in their styes to the people wandering about doing their daily tasks. Often there was as much enjoyment as in leaving the town to its own devices as to actually playing the game. Wow, this is turning out to be a massive episode and we still haven't covered two of the best game developers yet. Sensible Software. Ah, what a developing house producing some of the all-time favourite classic games. We have already covered the origins of the Software House in episode 11, but they would seamlessly jump across to the C64, to the Amiga, and actually improve themselves on the new hardware. First off was the interesting International 3D Tennis, released in 1990. Then they would release the brilliant Megalomania game in 1991, a real-time strategy game that kept things simple and fun. In the game you play a god who must lead his people to destroying all the other peoples on the map. This was done by learning new technology to advance the, your race, and then when you felt you had the upper hand, attack. The game was fantastic fun with great sound effects and it would be this viewpoint used in this game that would become the blueprint for so many of their other classic games. In 1992 the sensible chaps thought they would take on the might of kickoff with their own take on the football game. Of course the guys had already done micro soccer which had come out just before kickoff. In this, by using the same high viewpoint as Megalomania, it meant that you could see enough of the pitch to make a passing a ball easier. Also, they added aftertouch, allowing you to curl the ball into the net. The game was brilliant, being much faster paced than kickoff, and it would quickly become a favourite with video game football fans. The game would naturally receive a multitude of releases on through to 1995, with the ultimate sensible world of soccer version 1.1, whereby the game had reached its perfection. In 1993, they would this time look to war with a brilliantly poignant blaster cannon fodder. In the game, you had to guide your trusty squad through a series of conflicts. Despite the humour in the game, it also left a clear message of the futility of war, as you saw your fallen comrades on the hill as the new recruits line up ready for the slaughterhouse. A real classic, where war has definitely never been so much fun. One of the great things about the Amiga was its thriving demo and homebrew scene. As well as the commercial releases, there was a thriving community of demo houses, pushing the capabilities of what the Amiga could do. And even today, those demos by LSD and Space Balls, for example, still impress. But prior to the internet and the truly global nature of the scene, how did the scene keep in contact with each other? Well, in the main, this was done through free disc magazines, readily being distributed, with the most famous being Grapevine Disc Mag by LSD. For those young enough not to remember a world where the internet wasn't commonplace, it's difficult to appreciate how important these magazine discs were, with them not only being the glue that held the scene together, notifying the next demo parties that would be released, but also filling the mag with a wide range of topics. I particularly love the paranormal and bizarre sections. Reading these as a teenager back in the day seemed so exciting and underground. 
even if what you read you took with a pinch of salt. Of course, the scene had its underbelly, with the cracking communities who had fiercely tried to outdo each other to be the first to crack the latest releases. This gave gamers in the know easy access to all the games for free, but of course, sadly, would end the demise of many a publisher of the time who weren't selling games in such rampant piracy. Well, that's the end of part H. Please go on to part I, and I promise you this is going to be the last part to this episode.